Okay, we're in Matthew 28, verse 1 to 8, and uh, we're looking at who will roll the stone away. Now, whilst we are in Matthew 28, um, looking to the account of the resurrection, I'm taking my title from the Gospel of Mark, and I'll just read that to you. Mark 16, verse 2. Very early on in the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they, and who's they? That was Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, and another lady by the name of Salome. Just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and had asked one another, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? So, as we come to the account in Matthew 28, let me just make a, a couple of preliminary, very obvious, simple observations. And the first one is, is that our godly desires are not always fulfilled by God. They may not be granted at all. Uh, look at verse 1. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. They've, they're grieving and they have gone to see the body of their Lord. Now look at verse 5. The angel said to the woman, Don't be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. If you stop there, that would have been a moment of grief. They came with the hope of anointing the body of their Lord, and suddenly their hopes appear to be dashed. Uh, indeed, these particular hopes were never realized. Well, the obvious lesson of that is that, same for us, even our godly desires and efforts might not be granted by God. And that's simply because they just don't fit in with his much higher and better plan. I, a long time ago, I, I, I may have shared this illustration, but uh, it's a true story, and it, it concerns a lady by the name of Corrie Ten Boom. She was a, a Jew, and she and her sister Betsy were arrested by the Nazis and sent to the Ravensburg concentration camp, uh, which is a concentration camp just for women. Well, she and her sister were thrown into an old damp cell which had cracks in the wall through which mosquitoes flew in in, their, in fresh numbers and tormented the sisters. Well, Corrie said that she and her sister, they prayed not only feverishly, but incessantly for God to take away these mosquitoes, but he never did. And she thought to herself, this is just such a simple thing for God to do for us. And to her dismay, God never did anything about it. Well, when they were finally released, she discovered that the male guards had been repeatedly uh, abusing the, the female inmates, and yet she and her sister had remained unmolested, all because the mosquitoes were so thick in the air in their cell that the guards couldn't bring themselves to enter. And she said, I, I never knew it, but all along, God was sending those mosquitoes in there as little sentries to guard his daughters. So the first thing that just you know, leaps off the page is that you know, sometimes our godly desires and our efforts are just, they don't amount to anything. And God gets in the way of it because he's actually working on something different and working on something better. And then, of course, sometimes Jesus just isn't there when you need him. Verse 5, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. Now, of course, their immediate heartache was rapidly vanished when, uh, when those words were followed by, He's not here, He's risen. So whenever it looks like Jesus hasn't showed up when you expected him to, when you need him to, it's always because he's working on something better for us. You remember John chapter 11? Jesus gets the news that his friend Lazarus is very sick, and then we read in verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. He deliberately failed to show up. Ever had that happen in your life? Then four days after Lazarus had not only died, but had been in the tomb, Jesus makes his appearance. And in verse 21, Martha said to Jesus exactly what her sister says to him later. So you know this is what they've been discussing. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So she and her sister, they, they knew Jesus. 
as somebody who could prevent a person from dying. They understood that, that he could make a sick person well. It appears that that's all they knew about him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I, I know he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies and whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So Jesus didn't show up when they needed him to and he, he, he let their brother die and he let them go through a week of grief and what did he do that for? Because he didn't want her just to believe that he was somebody who could make a sick person well. He wanted to reveal to her that he could not only raise the dead and he could raise the dead because he was the resurrection and that he would raise everybody who ever believed in him. Massive revelation to two women. But it was a revelation that they had to go through a great deal of pain to be in a position to receive. The women asked, who will roll the stone away? Well, Mary and Martha found out the answer to that question that day. Only Jesus, only the Son of God. Why is Jesus the only one who could roll the stone away? Well, because of what the stone signifies. And the, first of all, the stone represents the death of death. Verse two. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. So you have an angel here that in his own power could do nothing, but empowered by God, rolls away the stone. But angels can't raise the dead. Romans 1, 4 says, Jesus was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Only the Son of God can roll away the stone of death. You remember Samson? Uh, you read of Samson, and it, one of the stories is he arose from his sleep when he's surrounded by his enemies, and then leaving the city, he, he tears up the gates of Gaza, tears them off their hinges, and carries them on his shoulders away into oblivion. Well, Jesus, our Samson, he tore the gates of death off their hinges. Carried them away on his shoulders forever. And now whosoever believes and lives and believes in him, he said, will never die. Why? Because the stone of death has been rolled away. This one old Puritan preacher, he said, death's ancient prison house is now without a door. Hebrews 2.14, since the children have flesh and blood, Christ shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Who will roll the stone away of death? Only the Son of God. And only because the stone represents the death of death, and the stone represents, of course, the greatest victory in the history of the universe. Verse six, he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Now I have told you. So when the women hurried away from the tomb, they were afraid, but they were filled with joy. So their grief has been turned into unbridled joy because of this insane victory over death, the victory of the resurrection. You see, you see this celebrated all through scripture. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul celebrates this victory saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting of grave? Where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says to death, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It, it was a great victory. It was a great victory over Satan. Uh, Colossians 2.15, speaking after the resurrection, says that Jesus disar disarmed powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. 
So it was a victory over Satan, but it was also, of course, the great victory for all who would believe in him. In John 16, 20, Jesus tells his disciples before he went to the cross, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. A woman giving birth has child pain because her time has come. But when the baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I'll see you again and you will rejoice and no one will ever be able to take that joy away from you. It's the great joy of the believer. It's also, of course, the great hope of the believer. One of England's great statesmen was a fellow by the name of Sir Walter Raleigh. Well, as Shakespeare said, uneasy is the head that bears the crown. The more important you are, the more likely you are in danger, especially in those days. And he was beheaded in 1618. But they found in his Bible, after he had been killed, uh, this poem. And it was a poem that he wrote the night before his execution. Now, you might not understand the first part of it, this was written in the 1600s, but the last two lines you will surely appreciate. Here's a man facing death, and he said, as he reviews his life, he said, even such is time that takes in our trust, our youth, our joys, and all we have, and pays us but with age and dust, who in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our ways, shuts up the story of our days. But from this earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up, I trust. Who rolled the stone away of what would have been otherwise his hopelessness? Only Jesus. Only the Son of God can do that. In John 14, 19, the Lord made the promise to believers, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. Paul celebrated the resurrection. I don't know if you know it, but do you know that Job in the Old Testament celebrated the resurrection? It was the truth of the resurrection impressed upon him by God that got him through his sufferings. Job said, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. How could he say that? He could say that because he knew that even if God was to put him through something that would result in his death, he would live again. In Job 19, 28, Job says, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. The, the, if you ever read the sufferings of Job, they are many and very profound. And yet God's spirit rolled away the stone of hopelessness in his life, which only God can do. That stone represents the death of death. It's the greatest victory in the universe. And so the stone represents the central issue of the Christian faith. It's the central truth. Look at verse 5. The angel says to the woman, do not be afraid. Why, why, do not, why, why should I not be afraid when everything's gone wrong? For I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. And here's why you don't have to be afraid. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said. It's the central truth of Christianity. Paul, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, where he argued, if Christ be not raised, our preaching is useless. So is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we've testified about God that Christ ra was raised from the dead, but, but, it, but God didn't raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, and those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. It's, it's the keystone of Christianity. That's the arch stone. If you pull that out, the whole edifice falls to pieces. I mean, if, if the resurrection is not true, we can say that Jesus was a liar. Because in verse 6, it says, He has risen just as he said. 
If we say the resurrection's wrong, the whole story falls to pieces. Uh, I'll tell you a true story. There's a five-year-old, his name was Brian, and he was given the pivotal verse to recite at the kindergarten Easter program. And of course, his verse was, he is not here, he is risen. But unfortunately, <laughs> when the time came, uh, the five-year-old couldn't remember what he had to say. So of course, the director had to quietly lean down and whisper to him his line. Well, then he confidently grabbed the microphone and triumphantly shouted, he is not here. He's in prison. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, you get that, if you get that one line wrong, you get that one truth wrong, you kill the whole play. You kill the whole program. The stone represents the death of death, the greatest victory in the universe, the central issue of Christianity, and also it represents the dividing line of humanity. Verse 4, the gods were so afraid of him, of the resurrection, that they took, they shook and became like dead men. Verse 5, the angel said to the women, don't you be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. You notice that the, the stone became, a, it's a dividing line separating unbelievers from believers. On, on one side, you've got people of the stone who are being described here as being like dead men. They shook and became like dead men. And on the other side, you've got those who are described as looking for Jesus who was crucified. A person's position on the resurrection indicates whether they're spiritually alive or whether they're spiritually dead, as dead men. They may not be physically dead, but they're dead to God. And that's because of all the doctrines in the Bible, it is the doctrine of the resurrection that, that is the point at which a man or a woman is either drawn to Christ or is offended by Christ. It's the resurrection. It, Paul is preaching a sermon in Acts chapter 17. And in verse 31, in the middle of his sermon, he says, For Christ has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man appointed. It wasn't, it wasn't that that freaked him out. And he has given proof of this by all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Dot, dot, dot. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. The dividing line. Acts 4.2. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. How, how upset were they? They seized Peter and John and because it was evening they put him in jail to the next day. But many who heard the message believed. The roll away stone represents the great division of mankind. You're either on one side of it or you're on the other. It's not only the point at which a man or a woman is either drawn to Christ or is offended by Christ, but it's the, it's the point at which you're either terrified by Christ, by Christianity, or, or the story overwhelms you with joy. You see, on one side of the stone we read in verse 4 that the gods were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men, and on the other side, the women were afraid, but filled with joy. There's nothing that could be more wonderful news to a believer than to find out Jesus' words, because I live, you shall live also. That's just nothing but good news. I remember my mom became a believer for the first time and I was living in Germany and she, her mother had been a believer, but she, she had gone, my mother, most, all of her life up to then, uh, not believing a thing. And then finally, she came to faith and came to visit me in Germany and we were walking through a little graveyard and she thought, and I said, did you realize that your mum, you'll see her again? She'd never thought of that. And, and the joy that came over her face. Well, nothing could be more wonderful to the believer, but nothing could be more terrifying to the unbeliever than the truth that Christ has been raised from the dead because it means he ever lives and will one day judge the living and the dead. And the book of Revelation describes the terror of unbelievers who will have to face a resurrected Jesus one day. 
Revelation 6, 15. We've read this before. Then the kings of the earth and the princes and the generals, the rich and the mighty and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks in the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks and said, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? In the same way, as the Bible says that in Romans that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes, be sure of this, that all things work together to the, to the bad, to the horror of those who do not love God and have no interest in his purposes. Well, finally then, this question we might want to ask ourselves is which side of the rock are we on? You know, to whom... Who are those to whom the resurrection will become an overwhelming joy? Is this, is this me? Notice the angelic message. You notice he didn't say anything to the people who are on the wrong side of the rock, the stone. For those who are literally engaged in opposing the kingdom of God, which is what those soldiers were doing, they got no message. They received no message. In Matthew 13, 10, we read that the disciples came to Jesus and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He, re he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. So, so who, who are the people to whom the resurrection became an overwhelming joy? It's those who received the message. Secondly, those who are, were, and are looking for Jesus. Don't be afraid, he said, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. I think a simple and repeated and wonderful biblical truth is, is that if you find yourself looking for the real Jesus, the only reason you're doing that is because God and Jesus is looking for you. That's why, and that's why the message of the angel is, so therefore, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid he'll turn you down. You don't have to be afraid he'll push you away uh, because you've been evil. No matter how bad you are, if you're looking for the real Jesus, that's because he's looking for you. Well, who's the real Jesus? Verse 5, the angel said to the women, don't be afraid for I know what, that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, he's risen, just as he said. The real Jesus is the Jesus of the Bible. The Bible, just as he said, who was crucified and who rose from the dead. Who, who are these people who will be overwhelmed with joy? The people who receive the message, who are looking for Jesus, and those who believe God's word. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Um, it's those who freely confess that they're believers in Christ. Verse 7, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he's risen from the dead and going ahead of you into Galilee. Then you will see him. Now I have told you. Remember in Mark 8, 38, Jesus said, If anybody is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation, I, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. He's not talking about here witnessing and winning people. He's just talking about being unapologetically a believer in Jesus Christ. To whom is the resurrection an overwhelming joy? Those, I'll look at it a different way. Those looking for Jesus. Who's that? Those who receive the message, those who believe the message, those who confess the message. In other words, people who both fear God and who adore God. The women left away from the tomb, afraid and yet filled with joy. Is that you? At Tewin Churchyard in Hertfordshire in England, and you can look this up on YouTube, some lady's done a, gone to the actual grave herself. There's a, a giant four-trunked tree that's growing out of a grave. Now, the grave from which it grows is a lady by the name of Lady Anne Grimston. Now, Lady Anne Grimston, she didn't believe in life after death. In fact, she mocked the whole idea of it. And as she lay dying in her palatial home, and it was a palatial home, it's still there, she said to a friend very sarcastically, she said, well, you know, I shall live again as surely as a tree will grow from my body. She was buried in 1713 in a marble tomb and a giant marble slab was put over the top of it and a little iron railing around that slab. Well, years later, 
the uh, marble slab was found to have moved a little. And then it cracked. And then a little seedling poked its way through. The tree continued to grow. Today, it's just, it's just huge. It's, it, it, it's actually surrounded the entire tomb with its roots. It, 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 it's taken the, it's overgrown the actual uh, uh, iron fence and they've had to put a new one around it. And um, this tree that Lady Anne Grimstone's grave is one of the largest sycamore trees in England. And it stands there to this day as a monument to the truth that we shall live again. As surely as that tree grew from that woman's body. And who is it that rolled the stone away that once stood in the way of that hope? The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's pray.